Hello friends, welcome back. Last time we left off, we saw the formation of the Great Kingdom of England under Ethelstan. But sadly, that Great Kingdom's future was not bright. And with the mess that was the succession at the time, no wonder. Let me explain. The person to succeed Ethelstan was his half-brother Edmund. His reign was short and bloody, constantly fighting against the invasions from outside forces, both Viking and Scottish. Out of those battles, the Scots took back Strathclaw, the Vikings taking Northumbria, and with Edmund dying in a battle with an outlaw. He only had six and a half years on the throne. He was succeeded by his brother Edred, who was smarter than his brother, and when seeing the terrifying chance of England being retaken by the Vikings, struck first, smashing the rule of Eric Bloodaxe quickly. But with seeing the chance of a competent king again, Thor cursed Edred with illness and made him sick to the point when he was offered fruit. He would suck out the juices and spit out the dead remains, using what little life forces left to fully submit Northumbria to his rule before dying and being succeeded by Edmund's child, Edwig. As expected, bringing the 15-year-old boy to the throne was seeming like a horrible idea to everyone with sense. Sadly, that was in short supply during his reign. Everyone from the petty nobility to the sinful priests were fighting over who should help him. <coughs> I mean, help him. But of course, it only got worse, with Edwig meeting a woman, Elfwu, and falling in love with her, and married soon after. Now, putting aside the terrible name, was also a terrible problem with her past. She was a third cousin twice removed from Edwig. Let me say that again. She was related as a cousin to her husband, the King of England. It wasn't surprising that the Pope, upon hearing of this, quickly cancelled the marriage and told him to stop with the cousin f***ing bullshit. And Edwig, in his rage, decided to appoint a bishopric to an incompetent yes-man as the Bishop of Canterbury. The little twerp died in 959, with the nobility and church planning on separating the kingdoms, and his brother Edgar the Peaceful taking the throne. Edgar's reign was finally, after so many terrible kings, a glimmer of hope on England. Yeah, okay, Edred was alright, but really, he just did a directed DVD remake of Ethelstan and Alfred's campaigns, although credit where it is due. But for now, let's focus on Edgar. During his reign, he replaced and cut unnecessary expenses, and was a good judge of character, replacing the Bishop of Canterbury with Dunstan, a man renowned for over two centuries for his adventures, myths, and victories over Satan. Truly a worthwhile friend and Edgar agreed. He also decided for his crowning he needed to make it special, truly worth the glory of having such a title bestowed upon him by civilization's creators of Rome themselves. And to do that, he called upon Dunstan, and together they created a lavish coronation ceremony that would continue throughout the rest of English history.
finally, the people of England got a taste of stability, which they saw through the entirety of his reign, because of the fact that he did absolutely nothing but being relaxed and still sticking it to the nobles. As time continued, however, the people looked on in worry, as in the old age he became weaker and weaker, yet still keeping his wise and peaceful attitude all without. When he finally died, the people mourned and slowly came to the realization that they don't know who is the rightful king, and therefore the realm didn't have a ruler, and that stability should end. Much within the nobility adored the king's younger son, Ethelred the Unready, and the remains of the nobility and church decided to support Edward, including Dunstan. The support of such wise men was enough for Edward to be chosen for this role. But as jealousy for the treatment and respect that was given to the men of the church, the nobility attempted to seize the lands given to the priesthood by Edward. When Edward protested, the nobles backed down, but only to form a conspiracy. Deep within the castle of London, Edward slept in his dead chambers, only to hear the creaking of a door as a group of paid assassins breached into the room and went to kill him. He tried to resist, but it was too much. He then died, with Dunstan calling him Edward the Martyr. It was during this age that the people of England saw dark clouds returning to the Isles, as a king no older than twelve took the throne, and they knew that they were not out of trouble yet. Ethelred the Unready had taken the throne. He knelt his knees to the Danish and begged for them to spare him only to see that with Vikings, you cannot do such things. The demon king, Sven Forkbeard, forced Ethelred to head to Normandy, a region in what was Charlemagne's kingdom, now called France. Once the boy was pushed away, the Danes did the unspeakable, and took the throne for themselves. Thor decided to play a cruel trick by having Forkbeard die, and Ethelred take the throne for two years only for him to then die and be replaced by his son Edmund Ironside. But he was too weak and was replaced by Forkbeard's hellspawn, Knut. Knut's rule was that of hell upon the English world, with regular feasts upon the flesh of women and the sacrifices of men. But his decadence so high and his pride so enormous, he shouted regularly to the waves to halt, as if it were a god of something other than chaos. His rule came to an end slowly, with him being powered by nothing more than the flesh of the innocent. When he did eventually die, there was infighting amongst the Vikings upon who was to rule with his son, Harthagnut, having to battle many civil wars. Vikings, seriously, no sense of loyalty. While that chaos its havoc amongst England and their mud huts in Norway, Edward the Confessor stood on the shores of Normandy, hearing the cries of pain from his subjects back home, begging for him to save them from the chaos, infighting, and madness of the times. So Edward boarded his ship and sailed over to England, marching with the people victoriously as the followers around Harthacnut faded slowly, slowly, and slowly. Later, after Harthacnut heard the news of Edward's march, he quickly wished to sign a peace, having already lost Norway and now he is willing to discuss the terms for his surrender. But it was decided that upon his death, if he had no kids, then Edward will be the King of England. And luckily for Edward, Harthacnut died shortly after that signing with no children at all. I guess God really was rooting for Edward. Edward stayed true to his pious nature even after that, almost to maybe a bit too much of an extreme, not consummating his marriage once with his wife, leading to him being childless and in need of an heir. His choices lay with the Duke of Normandy, named William the Bastard, to whom he saw the unbridled potential in. There was also his right-hand man, the Duke of East Anglia, the ass in the castle, Harold Godwinson. Old and frail, Edward told Harold that he picked William. In a rage, Harold stabbed Edward dead, with Harold ripping the crown off his head, and in a panic, telling his men to bury Edward and have him crowned so quick as to happen on the same day. Meanwhile, hanging out in Normandy was William, 
angered at the choice for leadership in the English throne, but respecting his dead friend's wishes. That was until the ghost of Edward the Confessor came before William, telling him of the murder for the crown, the corruption of Harold, and how he, William, a man who was treated like nothing because of his birth, is the only one with both the intelligence, charisma, and humble nature that could save England from destruction from within and outside. William then set off, like his old friend Edward all those years ago, to cross the seas and save England from her foes within and outside. But Satan had caught wind of this act and conjured a terrible gust of air, halting all ships from passage to England. But as the winds halted William to the south for now, up north, Thor gave one final try to conquer England like the days of Guthrum before it was too late. Using all of his remaining power, he conjured up a being of pure evil and vengeance. He created Harold Hardrada. And although the Lord wanted Harold to lose to William, he did not want to lose England to the Vikings once again. So God himself had to help the sorry king defeat the Viking horde, as his own army was too afraid and weak to deal with such a mighty force without divine intervention. Riding back home, Harold began to celebrate his victory. It was then that Harold heard that William had parted the seas with the sheer force of God himself, crossing over into the Isles and preparing for a fight for the fate of England, raising his slow and weak army against William's fresh and seasoned veterans. The battle would come to be at Hastings. The battle began in the favor of the pretender Harold, his army standing atop a hill and holding out against all odds against the Normans. That was until William came up with a master plan. Him and his men fell back, pretending they had been defeated. Harold then moved him and his men forward to chase after the Norman army, only for the Normans to turn around and attack the now open and surprised defenders. During the end of the battle, William raised the bow and fired an arrow right into the eye of Harold, killing him instantly. The day was won, England was saved, and Edward was avenged. William was no longer the bastard of Normandy, but a conqueror of England, and the second founder of his new kingdom. From that point on, historians look back on that battle with envy, and kings look on with awe as he established a new age of liberty, prosperity, and strength. And with that great victory, the legend only grew better. As news of William spread, the peasants decided to revolt, only for them to be easily crushed by William's invincible army. Future historians would then spread the lie that the people actually supported him, and that William killed them for no good reason. But seriously, that's what happens when such heresy and petty belief spreads to intellectuals. <sighs> Anyways, because of the once proud Anglo-Saxons being corrupted by the Vikings, William knew he had to transform them back into great warriors using ancient Norman magic. You see, the Normans, unlike the Saxons, were descendants of Rome, not just conquered and civilized by it, but part of Rome themselves. This gave them the power to civilize unworthy peoples, not just defeat them in battle. Using this magic, William transformed the Saxons into proper Englishmen with new powers and a greater thirst for glory, one which soon made them look beyond their borders. But for now, William continued with the normification of England. He continued by developing a long list of nobles' property, patrolled the nation regularly, and made himself the largest landowner directly in charge of the finances and taxes, cutting many nobles out of the larger picture, and thereby decreasing corruption. As he aged, he did notice a strife between him and his child Robert, to whom was talking to the King of France an awful lot, and seemed to have been plotting something. William rode off, even in his old age, to confront the French king on his crimes, but fell ill along the way, and felt slowly more and more unfit for such a task. As he lay sick on his deathbed, he decided to give Robert Normandy, in order to hopefully sate his young child's appetite for power. He gave his youngest son, Henry, some money, which he also did to the church and the poor. He ordered all of his prisoners to be released so no bad blood would come to the future. And to England? To England, he gave his most treasured son, his warrior, scholar, and genius of a son, William, the Younger. He then was buried in the French lands to which he grew up and sadly his body would be mutilated multiple times over by jealous peasants. One of the worst being in the era of revel. Well, 
that's a far way down the line. For now, it would just be enough to say that although William had died, he gave England a second wind against her foes. A new enemy would begin to arise to challenge her after that. But that is a story for another day. See you then.